Are you a slave master in search of something new? Are you an enchantress with an ever insufficient magic budget? Are you a misunderstood genius? Sign up with the Dungeons Company. Assemble your ideal team, train your monsters to defend our treasures from ever stupider heroes. Feel free to give us a call by Crystal Ball at and become a part of the legend of Keepers. Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen. Today I will ask and answer one simple question. WTF is Legend of Keepers. It is a concept about learning when you've met your future wife and not letting her go for some stupid reason. It is also a game about being an employee of higher rank at this dungeon company, or dungeons company, which somehow has turned e being evil into a business idea and a very profitable one at that. They attract all sorts of employees. You'll find goblins, ghosts, uh, I don't know, gnolls, spellcasters, demons, a lot of things. And I say things because some of them cannot be described better than an it. But anyway, so you're an employee at this company and you command all these quote-unquote smaller or lesser beings, though some of them are quite fearsome, and the characters that you see on the screen are playable. You play as one of these three and they command a dungeon and you buy traps, you upgrade traps, you buy employees, you upgrade your employees, and you can also collect artifacts. Now the problem with that is that there isn't too much customization in the game itself. You can name your employees and you can do a few other things like uh, pick skills after you finish a run. But when it comes to being able to customize anything, this game does it worse than Darkest Dungeon. And I think that the best comparison that I can give you if you want to have a, you know, quick start onto what the game is, is it's Darkest Dungeon but in reverse. And obviously our difference is like the hero and whatever. But you can imagine the hero being the boss at the end of a dungeon, yeah? A dungeon in the darkest dungeon, that is. Anyway, let's look into the settings menu. You can, and I was surprised by that, you do have a lot of localization, including several Chinese, presumably, or Chinese and Japanese. I don't know, I can't recognize those. But you do have several localizations, and of course I'm an impersonator, so I'm not Total Biscuit, I am Czech, and I tried the Czech translation, and there are several errors with it. Some of the technical aspect, others of that make me wonder if the person even played the game or knows what it's about but i digress um general settings so you can pick your language there's a lot of localization available and was even before the official 1.0 release you have a setting regarding your monster management you can also have a quick monster placing i haven't tried the feature out because i like having control over what happens when i'm defending and this this setting about team management before dungeon is basically a your employees the monsters you get and everything do have morale that is the only limitation that they have when it comes to whether they will or will not fight for you if their limit if their morale gets too low or motivation as the game calls it if their motivation gets too low they will suffer a burnout and you have to let them rest for about 10 weeks which can sometimes be a big problem. So you want to manage that, manage them, and preferably not ever have them burn out. But if at a certain point you acquire enough of them, of the defenders, then you can also afford to let them burn out. Never means that whenever you click start for the defense phase, it will never open any menu or anything. If you click smart, it will pause and open a menu and show you that perhaps one of the defenders is actually about to be burned out or burned out if they die during the defense because that's the only way that somebody loses morale in a big way. There are small ways, but they can be... There are also small ways to gain morale. So it's like, you know, it's the main way you will lose morale when defending. And always means that it's always going to open the menu. I like, personally, I like the smart option because I don't necessarily need to open the menu every time. There have been a few occasions where I remembered and thought to myself, wait, 
I actually wanted to put this monster elsewhere, and now I can't. It's like, oh, well, that's terrible. But I managed to pull through. So I have it on smart. Video, you have resolution, which goes all the way up to 5120 by 1440, which I don't know what that even is. It's probably a very, very large monitor, including this one. Quality goes up to ultra. I currently have it on very high. Though the game defaulted it to medium. I, I don't know why. I have 32 gigabytes of, of uh, graphics card and RAM. Or 20, yeah, 32. And I'm not sure why they default to medium, but maybe it's... Uh, it's for the better, you know, in case you suffer some technical difficulties. Windows full screen, and you have screen shake and V-Sync. I haven't felt the need to adjust either. Audio, you have a slider for both the sound effects, music, ambience, and voice. But from what I've played so far, they come in, in great balance. So whoever's in charge of that, good job. You also have a modding section, and you this is a quite... Uh, not an unconventional menu, but because I have seen it in a few other games, like Legend of Iridus also had a modding and, and some other things like this on the main menu. But that there is a... Well, not modding. Legend of Iridus didn't have modding from what I recall. And that Legend of Keepers does have a modding button right on the main menu. I think that is an opportunity for a lot of uh, longevity for the game and maybe a lot more content. If you look at what people have done with Darkest Dungeon, they've also done quite a lot when modding became a thing. Though I don't know if it's officially, I forget often. Anyway, let's get on to a adventure, shall we? So you can have up to three saves. And uh, in, in the beta, which is when I got access to the game, you only have campaign. Now, I do have a few criticisms of the campaign, but I'll get onto them in a minute. And after the full game released, you also have Ascension and Endless Mode. Endless Mode is, I think it adds a lot to the game. And I did feel like there was something missing in the beta. And this kind of helps, but it still feels like there's something missing. And I can't really define what. Maybe a longer campaign, maybe a more unique campaign. I can't really tell at the moment. But you have your save slots. And from what I understand, the save slot is the only place that keeps the level. So if you want to start fresh from level one, just make a new one. And which I will for the moment to show you the show you the menus and the layout. So these are the three heroes. And this is the talent tree. You can have up to I think maximum level is 30 that I saw it on on the developer stream and a few times when I opened the Steam page. There was somebody with level 30 and anyway each of the characters has a unique and specific skill tree and they will adjust the way in which you play quite severely even something as small such as uh this very first thing it's like grants the master enraged each time he takes damage this can drastically increase the damage output of your of your master at the end of a dungeon and you can also have things that like um, recuperate morale for your defenders gain resistances, make things cheaper, have things like revive and, and whatever. Though, like usually, some of the skill points are more desirable than the others, but that's what you inherently have to do to make progression in a skill tree, uh, to give incentives to progress in the skill tree, because otherwise you can just pick the first things and be done with it. Now, this is the campaign. The campaign consists of five missions, Yes, and you see seven of these because one is Endless Mode and one is Ascension Mode. They are both locked until you finish the campaign. And I think that might be to the game's detriment. Because, I mean, it, it does help to learn the game, to, to play the campaign first. But I know that I, for example, would maybe want to play Endless Mode right from the start to, to have it open. Because there are times when I got frustrated with some of the campaign missions. And it was only for the slaveholder. I don't know if I was doing something wrong. But the slaveholder has a quite difficult time or had in my hands in two of the missions. I think it was the third and the fourth one. 
the others were fine, but the third and the fourth, for some reason, I had a lot of trouble. <sighs> right, so I can't show you the talents and whatever, and I would wish this was also unlocked right from the start. Because I can't show you the talents, because I have a run open on my other save slot. But uh, the slave holder is focused on two. Fearing the, fearing the heroes that come to attack your dungeon. And then uh, just doing damage over time and sometimes damage up front. You also notice that the minions and traps uh, are different when I click on the other heroes. Yes, they do also have their specific creatures. Enchantress is about dealing spell damage and summoning elementals and using elemental elemental traps. And the talents allow you to get extra treants, which are considerably bad, but also very useful in the way that you get them for free. You can get extra units, you can make them cost less, and so on and so forth. And the engineer is the most powerful one, in my opinion. Because she has these mechs, and the mechs have bar what's called a barrier. Nobody else has it. And the barrier is basically defensive points, like a defensive shield that never expires. And she also has, like, things that make other traps do much more damage. Or just give barrier points to the next defender group. And mechs also synergize very well, where one mech can give another shield. If the other has a shield, it does double the damage. If it also has double the damage, it, you know, and it snowballs. And if, I have to say the voice acting for everything that I've encountered so far is very good. They picked a great voice actor for the slaveholder. For this, for all of them, in fact. And also for the announcer, which you may get to see very soon. So let me go ahead and enter my current run. It's an endless mode. Now, a few things that you will in inevitably notice is that I got straight into a defense section. That is because I... I opened an encounter before closing the game the last time. It does save where you leave off. No saves coming. Now, you have, in the game, you have rarities as well. Not in the sense of white, green, blue, orange, but in the sense of regular and rare. Rare traps are very desirable. Same goes for rare monsters, because you're getting more for the, for the space that you use. Now, at the top, you see the order and the layout of the dungeon, because you're not always fighting in the same dungeon. You're fighting in across various dungeons. You're being teleported all over the place alongside your equipment, your uh, lieutenant, and everything else. So let's see. You have, for the attacking heroes, you have resistances, the fire, not fire, the damage they do, and where do they do it? They, they also have other skills. Some of them are uh, weaker, some of them are more powerful. Some of them are completely outrageous and busted, and I wish they didn't work in the way that they do. So compare Helga, which is a support character, it's a shaman level 32, with Merlin, which is an enchanter level 31. Merlin ignores the first attack that he suffers, and also randomly moves all monsters, which can screw your positioning and put the vulnerable one in the front, etc. Now, if you do not forget that he does that, you can intentionally put the weakest one in the front, and then when he shuffles them, he it will not be in the front. As far as I'm aware, it will always put it on a different position. It will never put it on the same one. Compare that to Helga, which just heals after the fight finishes and does burn damage. See, she's much less of a threat inside the fight than Merlin. And you do have attacks that target certain positions. Anyway, so I also have a trap which blocks all hero skills. And I think that includes passives as well. Some passives do not get blocked. I don't know how that works, but others do. So if I say put a mouth shutter over here, and I gotta say the art is absolutely amazing. If I put the mouth shadow over here, that means Merlin will not shuffle anything on this first group, which might be great because he has negative fire resistance, and I have see those two horn guys, second from the left and third from the right? 
they do a tremendous amount of fire damage. And if the target has negative fire resistance, it will ricochet to the others. So I put in Mouth Shutter. Merlin will have his mouth shut, and so will the Keeper, I mean the Innkeeper, but only for five turns. That's that. Now I will put... So, negative fire resistance on this one as well. Not on this one, but it should be okay. So let's put a demon here. A demon here. And since they do fire damage in an area, these guys are very resistant to fire damage. That's good. Especially considering the innkeeper does a lot. And Merlin does nature. Nature is more of a problem, but should be doable. And finally, let's see. I could do a... Well, no, he would die in a single hit. Never mind, let's put in a skeleton. This is a spell, which where you get to cast one of the three spells when the heroes go there. That's why it skips. Fire, nature, fire. And it's gonna shuffle, so... You go there, you go here, and you go in the back. Well, he's gonna get... If, he, if, if the tree gets put into front, he's gonna die terribly. Now, this restores maximum health, so let's put a gruesome surprise over here. And the Father of the Dawn... Father of the Damned is a con entirely different thing. You will see in a minute. There we go. Silence. Excellent. So, why did the skeleton just lose 50% health? That is because I have artifacts, which you can see over here. You can see what they do, and you can have up to five of them. As I said, there is no customization. You will not equip your characters with, with weapons, armor, and whatever, which I think could have been a thing here. Especially in endless mode, because I will talk about it in a moment. And and yeah, you can have up to five, five of these. The one that I currently have, that's making this, or causing this, is Miraculous Pill. Monsters placed at the back perform an additional attack, but lose 20 speed. And start with 50% maximum health. So basically this attacks twice, but has half the health. The skeleton already has low health, but it has an ability. If I put it in the back, it dodges the next attack. So, do I want to double poison or just attack? Probably attack. There you saw another activation. Damage dealt to heroes that are at max life is increased by 100%. It's also very useful. Now, let's burn them. There, he ignored the attack. Yeah, so, despite being silenced, his passives still work, while their passives do not work. So, there are some inconsistencies. Now, let's poison again. The way that overtime damage works is it stacks. Some things do a straight-up 5%, as you could see there briefly. Others do a stacking amount. Anyway, let's... Let's intimidate... Because, just like in Darkest Dungeon, you also have stress or, you know, motivation for the enemy. Now, this is, the, this is quite a good explanation by the, by the developers. The lower the morale, the more damage the heroes take. They start at 100%, unchanged, and then they see a drastic increase when they enter 25%. So playing on stress only is also a completely viable option. So, let's see. They are terrified, so let's just start doing that. This is a character that can never lose, in this slot, that can never lose motivation and will always be available if there is a room for him in the dungeon. And he has an ability which you can upgrade. Where for every character with less than 75% morale, he gets enraged. And it's just a good investment to upgrade him whenever you can. Yes, shuffled. And just as expected. Oh, but it didn't die because I have yet another artifact. Damage of the f damage that goes to the first 
I mean, first attack that goes to the creature in the back is reflected back to the attacker, so there's that. Now let's transform the group. Wonderful. Then apply toxins and finally slash the innkeeper. And as you can see, I haven't even managed to kill a single one. So what happened there? Well, this is the problem of the endless mode. In the regular campaign, it is balanced rather well, where enemies go up to level, I think, around 10. And your creatures go up to level 6 most of the time. You can level them past that. But therein lies the problem. In a regular campaign, you will never see these numbers. Oh, and she healed herself. Ah, oh, damn it. You will never see these numbers because I'm currently not sure how it works, but... But... Yes, welcome to my torture room. I can also just whip him, which might be a good idea, but you can see that I do have the buffs that the skills activated. I can challenge him or I can, I can just beat him. My, beating him might be the better way. So let's start cracking the whip. Aha. So the endless mode. In the campaign it's balanced rather well. But the problem with the endless mode is that enemies... It feels like they're gaining a certain percentage for every number of weeks. Yes. If you want more, come get it. But anyway. So, while I'm struggling to upgrade my monsters in any meaningful way, which in the campaign is not an issue, they keep on gaining ridiculous numbers. Up to a point of, you know, the AoE spellcasters and whatever, being able to wipe out entire groups in one attack. And that doesn't feel very good. Right. Usually, I think I would be in serious trouble, but I was very fortunate to find this artifact at the start of the game. Usually, the master, like, upgrading the master is a very difficult ordeal, but you may want to do it in some cases, as to not be defeated. But I found an artifact which makes the master get plus 8 power whenever I, whenever he defeats a character. So in here, he's, he's going to get plus 32. Wait, no, 24. Math. <laughs> right. Let's make another gruesome surprise. There we go, there's the motivation. Those that have died have lost two or one motivation. The resting characters gain up to three or four motivation. And you know this, that I lost six things, but only three have lost the motivation. That is why in the regular campaign, the shaman is, or the sorcerer, is incredibly powerful. The skill at the bottom, this one, Cain's Revenge, transforms a group into random skeletons, and the transformed beings do not lose motivation. And there are other things and the uh, creatures that allow you to manipulate the sort of motivation and whatever. See, here's a creature, no motivation loss when dying, and 50% chance to use a massive area fire nuke, which also damages your things, regardless of whether you use this attack or not when it dies. So, you can stack a... If you get three of these and you put them next to each other, you can cause a huge amount of damage, but only with a chance, right? Now, welcome to the schedule. We, we have a company and we run a tight schedule. It consists of two to three options, and it goes week by week. And when you mouse over the thing, it gives you what it does, which is incredibly helpful. So let's say I want to check out an event. Aha! An enthusiast has tracked an artifact to you and would like to buy it for a very attractive price. He seems to carry other similar objects on his person, and one of your employees would be able to steal one from him without noticing. Without him noticing. So it will randomize the creature that you have to have, and if you have it, you can get an artifact for free. What I noticed in a translation, and it was the check one only, 
there were errors. It said you had to have a succubus every time. But as you can see, that's not a succubus. It has wings. It's a harpy. So that was the first error. I do not ever want to sell the whip. It's the only reason why I'm still here in the game. Because the master starts with like 80 power. So I've, if I've effectively gained 460 power, mind you. And the power of the master does affect the spell power as well in the rooms. So my spell, my master spells would be doing nothing at this point. Anyway, I will never sell that. And so, as I was saying before, there's a problem of the enemies getting like an exponentially increasing amount of health and damage, while I'm seriously struggling to, to compete with that. So I think some balancing or something like that would be in order. Now, let's plunder. Yes. Tiredness. Hmm. I could use more gold, and none of these are incredibly important, so let's plunder. Aha. See, and there, it's going to take the skeleton 10 weeks to recover. Now the black market. Whew, it's getting crowded in here. Maybe I should sell some of the things. And I might do that, actually. Because I could use the gold, but leveling up is quite a difficult endeavor. So let's go for an advent instead. Ah. Lose life if you choose to face him. Actually, I've come to the conclusion that the life of my master is incredibly important because he's the only thing that is still keeping me in this week 202. So, let's send the dog to fight. And here we go. There's another criticism of the game that I would have. So, from top down, frozen caves, which is normal difficulty... No disasters, no resting rooms, you get a trap and gold. Middle is hard, right is hard, middle has a resting room, right has a resting room, and you get different rewards. What I do not think works properly is the difficulty. So left side is two swords out of five. Middle and right are four swords out of five. That is a lie. Most of the time I've had a much easier time trying to beat the higher difficulties, the more swords there are than the lower ones. I don't know how does that work, but I've had some serious complications and troubles when trying to deal with a one sword thing. More often than not, I actually got on to almost no health and I almost lost. So there is something, I think, going on with the difficulties. Anyway, let's go for a master bonus. Now, this is basically the endless mode. That's all there is to it. And you get some achievements if you reach a week 156 and this and that. The campaign is more interesting than that. But it does lack. It is like lust. Sorry, it is like luster. You get a series of scenarios that are basically handcrafted. You have a limited pool and the limited the pool consists of limited amount of traps or limited types of traps and monsters. You know, that is good. That is good. It, it is a cur curated experience. But what's the problem with that? You don't get to experience everything the game has to offer. And I think that's a shame. That's what I would want the endless mode to be available right from the start. Because it's also difficult to level the character you have when you keep on getting destroyed in specific missions. I think that one thing that I would want from the campaign is to be more, more unique. And I know that I do say that often. You don't know that, but now you learned it, so I screwed myself over, I guess. But I do wish that the campaign was a bit more unique. Maybe in like having a modifier in what happens every X weeks or... For example, mid-campaign you get different units and you need to adjust or something, something. And... Oh, no. Well... Yeah, I'm just doing this to, to do as much morale damage as I, can, as I possibly can. Because these guys have a lot more health than morale. And 
that is the case for most most of the heroes. They have one one something higher than the other, be it a defense stat, resistance, attack, or morale gain. So anyway, I would have liked to see some more uniqueness in the campaign, but for the purpose of making the player learn the game some more after the tutorial and communicating what actually happens to each of the characters, each of the masters, for that it's completely fine. You can see that the, the master picture is currently on fire. That is because I had the, the monster in the back here, the Time Lord, die. And when it dies, it gives all things in the dungeon plus 40 speed. Can I afford to take a shot and then take two hits? I think I can. Yes. Now, now let's do a... Actually... Hmm... Demoralized. No, so I have to use Sinister Roots here. Oh, hey, he didn't even die. Wonderful. So let's do a Wild Strike, which lowers the armor, which is very important because this character has an ability where it does 200% more damage if a character is in negative armor values. But since I do not want to lose motivation and they will not be able to kill this group anyway, let's just apply the Revenge, which changes the order and blah, blah, blah. So... I would have liked to see the campaign be more unique, and I do want to see some sort of rebalancing of the endless mode, because I I get that the eventual purpose of it is supposed for you is supposed to be that you entertain yourself, and in the process of entertaining yourself, you die, and you start again. But I don't think that's how it should end. You don't necessarily, you know, have to lose. This could go on forever with maybe increasing, not artifact slots, but like something. Giving it more thought, basically, is what I think could really help the endless mode. There we go. Away with you. Uh, away with you too. Oh yes, and there are other things that I forgot to mention. You can increase the speed of the animations, which is what I did. Um, you have a basic speed and then you have times two and I think times three. I have it at times two because that's the okay one for me. There we go. And now I have to put them onto, onto vacation or find ways to restore their morale. Let's do a workout. Upgrade maximum health. So how do you gain these? You have gold, tears, and blood. Well, they, they're self-explanatory. Tears are gathered from heroes who run out of morale and flee. Blood is gathered from heroes that die when they lose all health. Next. Available employees bonus. I'm going to go for this. That means that these get to defend once more before they have to go on a vacation. As for the campaign, so as I said, you get to learn what is the sort of backstory or story of each of the characters. Maug, which is the slaveholder, is basically with the company because, well, he likes his whip and he likes the sound of it lashing out against human skin or any other skin, but preferably human. And he is quite, from the looks, from not from the looks, but from the sounds of it, he's quite skilled with the whip. The engineer is formerly a, a supposedly a good 
character, which has been turned by some unknown entity into a human slash machine hybrid, and she also has gained severe mechanical skills in the progress. And she has joined the dungeon after that happened. And the Enchantress is just a really, really angry tree which wants to see humans suffer. Not, not, not necessarily just humans, but you get the idea. What else could I say? Right, I forgot to say the important part, where this game is made by Goblins Studio, and it's published by Goblins Publishing. And that's not a name that I see the first time. I have had previous encounters with, with uh, Goblins Publishing in the game Banners of Ruin. Now, Banners of Ruin is a good game. It's just not the type of game that I would necessarily want to play. And I noticed that they also have published one other game on Steam. There are currently three games on Steam from Goblins Publishing, and they are from a uh, different studio, each of them, if I recall well. Banners of Ruin, which is also a roguelike. Then you have this, Legend of Keepers, which is a pretty good game. And then you have As Far As The Eye Can See which is a rather interesting concept. I gotta say that the games that the company publishes are rather unique and rather interesting in the core concept. I'll give them props to, props for that. As for the, as far as the eye can see, that is a turn-based roguelike, where you build a base, a mobile base, and you have to set out towards a certain, certain place on the map. Right, I screwed up. I forgot that they are, the morale damage only works if they are slower than the character, which they're not, obviously. Oh, rip. <laughs> that was a disaster. Let's terrify them. And... As for the Ascension Mode, the Ascension Mode is a mode where I haven't played it yet, I don't feel compelled to do so, because the base game, or the Endless Mode is, uh, in my opinion, a lot more challenging, because you have to manage an ever-increasing ever increasing amount of stats on the enemy, while you struggle to gain 100 health on a, on a creature. There we go. So he's already died, but that shouldn't be a problem. Yes. In the em emptiness. Yeah, let's prepare him so that I can one hit send him running back to his mother. Let's, let's run this at speed one. Because the voice lines are designed in length to have enough time to be said on speed one. On speed two, he's always going to get interrupted somehow. You can crack the whip, and whiplash restores health if the target is bleeding, so there's a synergy here. I do think that there's some things that could be done elsehow or a bit improved. For example, I'm having much more fun when I have the whip, but you, I don't know if you get the whip every time. I don't think that is the case. And if each of the characters maybe had an item that they always started with, or an ability that they would always start with, like the for, you know, Slaveholder, the whip, because it doesn't really make much sense when he's all about you know oh yeah you got all you got past all my monsters and it's time to die now most of the time he's going to have pitiful damage and pitiful stats so with the whip that is not the case and he can single-handedly wipe out entire groups you know and i would like that to be the case for others but in a different way 
but you never get into too deep upgrading or customization of the character. You don't get to say in an expedition or in a in a in a run, you don't really get to, for example, upgrade the whip or get more abilities. So I mean the game works completely fine as it is. And it's good. But I would like to see it try and do more because what they already have here is a very solid core. And I just wish they added more on top of it to make it more compelling to play. Because I finished the campaign, and the endless mode is basically the campaign, but you will eventually lose. That's inevitable. And what else do I have to, you know, what else can I do? That That's probably my main, main gripe with the game. It's good, but I wish there was more of it, and that it was more, f not more fun, but that, that it had more, that they tried to do more. And I do understand that might be too ambitious, and I'm glad that they went for, you know, a little, that they did what they did and that it works and that it's fun. Because I don't think that the Goblin Studio has made that many more other games. I think this is their first game of this type. So quite ambitious, but they managed to, to pull it off. But at the same time, you know. Anyway. So, that's, I think, pretty much what I have to say about the, the game and the studio, and I will see you all next time. And, in fact, that's a lie, because I'm going to stop using the axe and then stop trying to be cynical over it, which has passed away, as you may or may not know, and I will talk about the game in my own way now. The game is pretty fun. Oh, it's refreshing to switch from the, from the British accent, which doesn't say any R's or anything. Ah, so anyway, the problems I have I laid out. It's like when I when I spend 250 gold and blood or tears, I get on some in some cases 10 health. And it's like at this point I would need much more for the creature to still be usable. So, you know, that's that there are problems with the game, but it's it's good. And you can upgrade only once per per trainer visit it's like why you know same goes for traps now what else was there i think that's pretty much it so this this video wasn't meant as a like an insult or something to total risk it it was more more like an idea of i want i did in the past past fuck in the past i did a video just like this but i think it was a poor quality and not very good because at the time I didn't know better how to exactly try and imitate what he does. I think now I did it, sorry, I think now I did it better. And and this was just basically not a tribute but like trying to imitate what he does because I think the format that he made is uh, very good and when I whenever I saw a WTFS I always knew what to expect. There would be a look into the game and a review uh, from him up to the point of what he reached, you know, the point in a game or like a level or something. And what he find what he found good and bad on the game so far. And if the game is worth your money, who is it probably good for? And And I think that we also do lack like this beacon that he sort of was when it comes to keeping greedy corporations and publishers in check because after he died you know when he was alive he got gearbox to actually stop undermining itself by making a deal with g2a and he did other things but after he passed it seems as if all hell broke loose because he had knowledge of the law that's what made him especially <laughs> threatening to companies because he knew he sort of knew what they shouldn't be doing and he knew what to say to get them to pay attention and even now that we do have people who know what to say they're not taken as seriously anymore because they don't have as much of an audience and that's a problem with youtube because it basically pushed all uniqueness and all personality away in in favor of a sterile environment where people which have no personality can thrive or like become famous over day or overnight instead of those who actually pay attention to their content their fan base and and have a personality and are critical of something 
Maybe I didn't put it the best way there, but I hope you get what I mean. So that is my thoughts on the game. And I, I wonder how much longer will I be able to go on for and what the current record is. But I will see you next time.